In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And with that Word, He created all things. The Word became flesh and made its dwelling and started to live among us. In 1 John, we see this unpacking of this concept of the Word of God. The Word of God being Jesus, but also the Word of God being the story of God. And we spent a fair amount of time this year off and on talking about this idea of the Word becoming flesh and moving into the neighborhood and taking up its residence in us. But you know, when we talk about the Word of God or the story of Jesus, yes, we're talking about Jesus himself, but we're also talking about his story or his identity or why he came to earth. And part of that is us getting to know the Word of God. And if you're honest with yourselves and most Christians in general, we don't give enough effort and energy and time into the study of the Word of God. In fact, if you were to think of it like, I don't know, like a road race Um, You know, there are plenty of people who are in the race and they're running full speed, but there's a bunch of people who, you know, there's kind of in cruise control and there's this apathetic sort of approach to the scriptures and, and they're, and they're falling by the wayside and getting distracted and easily, you know, you know, even confused or taking the wrong turn because, well, boredom or, or, you know, the difficulty level of scripture and all those sorts of things. But at its core, There's no greater vehicle than the Word of God to understand and comprehend the character, the nature, and the goodness of God, to grasp the life that He offers for us. And if we immerse ourselves in His Word, if the Bible becomes something that we take into our lives, then we'll have a better understanding of who God the Father is, who Jesus is, and who the Holy Spirit is in our day-to-day, everyday, living, sleeping, eating, boring lives. But to do that, you know, we really have to kind of make a, a commitment to become men and women of the Word of God. And part of the reason that I think it's so hard for people to study the Word of God is, um, you know, well, there's a lot of like excuses that we could use. But honestly, it's probably you could put it down to two like Bible study strategies that, in my opinion, just aren't the greatest strategies. Strategy number one, um, this is what probably leaves a lot of people disheartened with Uh, studying the Bible is sort of the cover to cover model. So you start with Genesis and it's amazing. It's the story of God creating humanity. And you know, like you're really excited about it. It's our origin story and it's really cool. And then you get to Exodus and it's Moses and the children of Israel and Pharaoh. These are the things that movies are made out of. And then you get to Leviticus and the book of the law. And then you're like, I don't understand any of this. And why is it here? And then you give up and you quit, right? And, and that's how it typically goes, right? Like you, you start reading and, and that cover to cover model is difficult. You have to be a disciplined reader and you have to be willing to power through some stuff that you don't understand because you don't have enough context or understanding of scripture as a whole to even understand it yet. And the Bible, we'll talk about it later, but the Bible's not really designed to be read that way, if that makes sense. And I'll help you unpack it later in the coming days and weeks. But the other issue that I find very interesting is sort of like the the flip and find um, where we take our Bibles and we just like flip them open to a verse and we go, okay, and then we and then we read a verse. And so like I did this today. Uh, I prepared a couple flip and finds for you. Um, one of them, I just flipped my Bible open and put my finger in it. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, it says, if two men are fighting And the wife of one of them comes to rescue her husband from the assailant. And she reaches out and seizes him by the private parts. You should cut off her hand and show her no pity. Well, that's a real uplifting word for the day, right? Or or how about this one from Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 12. Um, You shall eat it as a barley cake, baking it in the sight um, on human dung. So like, oh, okay, so the word of God says that I should eat barley cakes, but I should only cook them over dried human feces. What? And so like the flip and find method of just putting my finger in the Bible and say, God, what do you want me to do today? And then you put your finger in the Bible and then you read a verse and that verse is obscure and it's out of context and it doesn't make any sense. These are not the best methods to to accomplish your goals of having the word of God come inside of you. I mean, we already read that that verse in John 1, 1, uh, 
and verse 14, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, That Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. So for God to take up residence inside of us, it, it, we have to have a better understanding of what His plans and purposes are for us. And so what I'd like to do over the course of the next couple of weeks is, is kind of help you to study the Bible more effectively. Uh, allow you to go at a more rapid pace and have a deeper understanding. Uh, it's why I entitled this sermon series Zero to 100. I, I would like you to be able to really, at a high velocity, be able to really understand. And then also, you know, the the authenticity of your life will be shaped, the shaped by the Word of God. In fact, Scripture is good for, and this is why we need to study it, it's good for all sorts of things. Second Timothy uh, Paul writes to Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us what to do, what is right. God uses his word to prepare and equip his people for every good work. And so uh, today I want to give you like a sort of twofold um, opportunity to study alongside of me. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about five ways that you can study the Bible. And then at the same time, we're going to be looking at a very short book, the book of, of Philemon. Um, and so I'm going to take these five steps. And if you're taking notes, you could write them down. We'll come back to them one at a time in a minute. But you know, you want to choose a translation that you understand, number one. Number two, choose a time and a place and a plan to study. Number three, understand the context of what you're reading. And then number four, read slowly and ask questions. Number five, pray for God to speak to you and apply what he shows you to your everyday life. Now, uh, I'm going to give you those five things and we're going to we're going to spend two weeks together in this idea of zero to 100, increasing the velocity of our study by being intentional about the word of God. But I want to do it um, in a practical way. I don't want to just give you strategy and then not have any practicality to it. So I'm going to try to do it um, by looking at this book, um, this short little book together as we go through it. So when it comes to number one, choosing a translation that you understand, um, probably the translation that most Christians are the most familiar with is the King James Version of the Bible. Um, I mean, for, uh, it was you know, translated in 1611, so it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, it's not the first English translation, but it's definitely the uh, most used translation. And there are Christians out there who, I think they're a little bit intense, who say it's the only translation. In fact, there are some Christians out there that are just a little bit crazy, who say like the King James Version is the best version, um, and that Jesus wrote it, and that's the way that Jesus spoke these things aren't true. Um, the King James Version, while on face value, is a very good version. The language in the King James Version um, is hard to understand in modern language because we don't talk like that anymore. Plus, language changes over time. Let me give you an example. In, in Philemon chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, I'm going to read this to you from two, verse, two different translations, and maybe this will help you understand why different translations are important. So this is Paul, and he's writing um, to his friend um, who, he, who he knows and has known for quite some time. This friend of his, uh, Philemon, is a church planter, house church leader. Um, and this is what he says to him. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore thought I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. What? You see what I mean? Like we don't talk like that nowadays, so it's really hard to process the old English phraseology that was 1611 translations language of the day. In fact, if you were to just take a more modern version, and this one isn't even that modern. Um, this one's older already. I mean, it's not 1611 old, but it's older already. The NIV says it like this, the same verse. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, 
although I in Christ could be bold and order you what to do, I ought not to do that. Now, here's the difference, right? In the ancient, right, text from 1611, I'll call that ancient because it's pretty old, right? Um, and obviously the Bible was originally Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, but when the King James was translated and they translated it as literal as possible, there was still, even in that time, the belief that the core of the human emotion, um, where we felt our feelings was in the bowels. And so when he says, because of the bowels of the saints, right, he's saying <laughs> like, because we have love for you in our hearts and modern day people, even though we know this not to be true, we know that even now in modern day uh, scientific minds, we know that the center of emotion is the brain, not the heart. But it's very common for us to, to talk about our hearts as a place of our emotion, right? So it's, it's a little bit more modern. There's a, there's a lot of different translations out there for you to look at. Um, and I'm going to just give you my opinion on this and then we're going to move on into the other four areas really quick. Um, you should have more than one translation. Um, I think there are translations that are super accurate and then there are translations that are super easy to understand. Okay. So from, uh, an accurate perspective, um, the new King James, the King James, the new King James and the ESV are super, super accurate, but aren't necessarily the easiest to understand as far as modern day language, which still are very accurate. Um, but just easier to understand would be the NIV or the New Living Translation. So the New International Version or the New Living Translation, both of those, they you don't lose much accuracy um, at all. And you also get it to where you could actually understand it. Um, but there's over like 3,000 translations like on your phone. You could download the U version app, Y O U V E R S I O N. Uh, you can go to the App Store on whatever platform you're using. You could download that app and you can download over 3,000 translations to have on your phone. So you don't have to go out and buy three different $60 Bibles. I don't know why Bibles are so expensive, but they are, right? Um, and there you are, you have it. I personally, I like the NIV, the NLT, and then I really enjoy the Message Bible. Um, and then after that, I use the ESV a fair amount. Um, and then because I grew up in a relatively traditional church environment, um, last but not least, I still do read the King James Version of the Bible because I memorized some verses as a child in the King James. So King James, yes, I like it, but it's not my favorite. Um, I probably spend the most amount of time in the NIV, the NLT and the message, the ESV and the King James, all of these, they're great. But I think it's cool when you can put them side by side and you can compare and contrast and try to understand what's going on. So if you're gonna study the Bible effectively, you need to choose a translation that you have the ability to understand. I need you to be able to understand what you're reading. Otherwise, it is somewhat pointless. Number two, choose a time and a place and make a plan to study. This consistent time and place is super important. Now, I recommend the morning. Here's why I recommend the morning. This isn't a hard and fast. I don't have chapter and verse. People will take a verse and they'll say, early in the morning while it was still day, Jesus went to a solitary place to pray. That's why you should do your devotions in the morning. Okay, cool, sure. What I like about the morning is that it's the beginning of the day. So you're setting the tone for everything that comes after that. Um, I also found that for me personally, um, the morning was easier for me to steal time without cutting into time with my with my family. They were already asleep, so I would get up just a little bit earlier and spend time in the Word, and that would help me out. But it doesn't really matter if it's morning, afternoon, at night, um, but it's about having a place and a rhythm and a system. And so for me, it's always been there's a spot on the couch where I sit, and that's where I read my Bible. That's when I study. That's what I do. Now that um, more empty nest than ever before. Still have people in the house, but not as many. Um, I, I do spend some time reading the Bible every single day, but normally on a Wednesday afternoon or a Thursday afternoon, I actually go out into the backyard um, and I spend some time just studying the Word of God. And I get to go deeper than a daily devotion um, and study a little bit more intensely. And I'll spend a couple hours. And, and honestly, I do that every week, normally Wednesdays or Thursday afternoons. Um, and that, that helps me and that's the rhythm of what I do it. But you'll notice that I have a plan 
um, of how I'm going to do it. Every day I'm going to read my Bible. Normally my daily Bible reading is done digitally. Um, but when I do my deep dive Bible studies, I like paper Bibles. I like paper Bibles to go deeper. I love digital Bibles because they're quick and easy and I can access thousands of translations at a fingertip. But I, there's something about me that's a little bit old school that when I'm going to really go deep, I want to have highlighters. I want to have my notebook. I want to have pens and paper. Sometimes I have my laptop and my and my phone all there so I can do a bunch of different things at the same time. But the deal is this. Find a plan, make a plan, work a plan. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of reading plans that are available. Uh, we already talked about YouVersion. YouVersion has tons of Bible reading plans. But we also, if you're in a home group right now, in your home group curriculum every week, there's a five-day Bible reading plan that dovetails or goes along with the weekly sermon. So the goal would be for you to like at least start somewhere that'll help you to understand and go deeper. The reason I encourage you to use a reading plan that's not just a cover to cover or a flip and find is that it'll give you context and help you understand which brings me to point number three to understand the context of what you're reading you have to understand what's actually going on in the passage let me tell you a quick story and this will help you with context and then i promise we'll get moving and actually get into the word um what if i told you that there was a time that i was out in public um and i was dating a redheaded woman Yes, and people saw this redheaded woman and they were very upset that I was with this redheaded woman because everybody knows that my wife Jennifer is a blonde woman. And this redheaded woman, she had long, very silky, straight red hair. And everybody knows that my wife Jennifer is blonde with very curly, bouncy hair. And so when they saw me with this redheaded woman, they were very upset and they were even accusatory of what's going on, pastor, what are you doing? It's because they didn't have the context. The context was Jennifer just dyed her hair, um, but they didn't recognize her. She looked so different when her hair was dyed red that they didn't even recognize who she was. And actually at the grocery store, the checkout lady actually accused me of having an affair because she saw me in there with that redhead. It's so funny. I, you know, like, like, no, no, it's actually my wife. Jennifer came back to the grocery store with me later that week, not to prove the point, just happened to be at the grocery store. We went to the same line and I'm like, ta-da, it's actually her. Um, you know, but if you don't have context, it's easy to under misunderstand or to read into something that doesn't make sense. And so context is key. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about context a little bit today. Um, the context is not just what's going on in the verse, but also the context of the scripture as a whole. The Bible is not a book. So when I say that, this isn't like uh, Lord of the Rings or, you know, um, you know, Animal Farm or Old Yeller or, or on and on and on. This isn't a story that's meant to be read cover to cover. The Bible is a library or a collection of books to be specific, 66 different books. They were written in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Um, and they were written across three different continents um, over a time that was approximately 1500 years in duration. Uh, and there was 40-ish different authors. Some of them were shepherds, farmers, tent makers, doctors, fishermen, priests, prophets, poets, kings. Um, it's this collection of poems and prophecies and letters and laws and histories and biographies written by people inspired by God telling the unified story that shows us not only our need for Jesus, but teaches us to become more like him in our practical everyday lives. And so to study and understand the Bible, you have to have a context of the Bible. So when I say context, this is what I'm saying. When you're reading verses, you want to ask these questions. Write this down. Who wrote it? To whom was it written originally? And what was its purpose in its original form when it was written. And so we'll start, I told you we were going to use this short book, Philemon, to kind of unpack this idea of context, right? So in Philemon chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, the dear friend and fellow worker to the church that meets in your home. And so he's saying right out of the gate, the context is who write, who wrote this. So you can tell right away that this is a letter that was written by Paul. He's like saying, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, 
And so then you, you get some extra resources to find context. So the, the fastest way for you to find context in your Bible, if you have a modern NIV Bible or a study Bible of any kind, is normally at the top of the page, there's little notes for you to look at. So for example, in mine, um, at the top of the page where it says Philemon, it says, this is a brief letter. Paul urged Philemon, the owner of a runaway slave named Onesimus, to forgive the slave and accept him as a brother in Christ. And so in one and a half sentences, they summed up the whole purpose of the book. And so now you have a little bit of context. But there's other places and spaces that you can go for context. There's a lot of biblical um, resources, extra biblical resources that are out there. So you can use different study tools and study helps. Um, commentaries are great places to do that. But one of the quickest and easiest ways for you to get context on a on a story in the Bible, and I'm going to give you two resources really quick here. Uh, the first one, it's called Bible Gateway, BibleGateway.com. I use this all the time. You can uh, go to a verse, type in uh, information about it, click over on the menu on the side and find more information. And then there's a, a website called The Bible Project, and they have videos that are really well done. Um, they're almost, uh, they're hand-drawn Sharpie cartoons. Uh, and they last about eight, seven, eight minutes, um, and they unpack the entire concept of a book of the Bible. Uh, now, they don't have every single book of the Bible, but they have almost all of them there unpacking um, what's actually going on. So let me give you some context in to what's happening in Philemon in this first couple of verses. Um, we know that Paul wrote it. Uh, we know that by, by just looking at it, we know it's the shortest letter um, that Paul writes. Um, notice that Paul says, and so some of this is investigative and some of this is stuff that you can deduce or dig in or detect, right? Paul calls himself a prisoner of Christ. If you look at any of the other letters that Paul writes, um, Paul refers to himself as an apostle. He doesn't say that here, and here's why. Paul isn't trying to pull rank. That's why he says, um, you know, like earlier when we read it, I could tell you, I could force you to do this, but I don't really want to do that. What Paul's doing is he's, he's trying to connect with him on a meaningful, personal level. Um, and we know right away that the book is written about a man named Onesimus, who's a runaway slave. He had stolen from Philemon. Um, Onesimus ran away to Rome, and that's where he met Paul. Paul's in prison in Rome. He's on house arrest, most likely. Um, and Paul leads him to Christ, and he's been joining Paul, doing ministry there. Um, and so Paul's purpose is to encourage Philemon uh, to take Onesimus back and accept him as his brother and have him help him continue to lead the house church there, but also to maybe even plant other house churches um, as their story unfolds. Let's look at verses 4, 5, and 7. He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. And so right away, he sort of um, is, is giving some real sweet talk. It's a little bit of a buttering up. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not authentic or not real, but you could tell that there's a, there's a friendship there. But he's also, you know, sandwiching in with the ask some like flattery. And he says, your love has given me great joy, verse 7, and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. So he's reminding him in this moment that, you know, you're a great leader who's loved lots of people. And then he's about to sort of give the but. He's, he's saying, Philemon, you're so loving um, and you know what to do, what is right. So now that we know the context, we know like what's happening in the passage so now we can slow down. This was number four in our list of things to study the Bible. We could slow down a little bit as we read and start to ask ourselves some questions. So two questions, write this down. Two questions that you should be asking yourself in every time you read the Bible. What does this say about God? And what does this say about me? So in the passages I'm reading, what does it say about God? What does it say about me? Now you can go deeper as you're reading and, and you can ask some other questions. Um, you can ask, is there a sin to be avoided? Uh, is there a promise to be claimed? Is there an example that I should be follow? Is there a command that I should obey? Is there something that I need to know about God? Um, if you want to remember these, sin, promise, example, command, no. You can write spec, S-P-E-C-K. What's the little spec that I'm trying to find in the text this week? And we'll talk more about that next week as we go deeper into studying and, 
and understanding. And so just a quick review. Uh, you, you want to choose a translation that you understand. You want to choose a time and a place and make a plan to study. Uh, you want to understand the context of what you're actually reading and then read slowly and ask questions. And then I'm going to give you this fifth one um, and then we're going to kind of just wrap up as we kind of get the last little bit of this. Pray for God to speak to you and apply what he shows you. This is, this is super important. As you're reading the Bible, before you dive in, God, what do you want me to see? Um, and speak to me and show me what it is that I need to understand today. In Philemon chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, it says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. This is why he calls himself a prisoner as Christ and your friend and not an apostle. He's saying, hey, we're friends. Let's be friendly about this. I'm not trying to be boss you around because we're equals in many ways. He says, it is... None other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for you, my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. And so he's saying, yeah, I know Onesimus stole from you, um, and he, and he, now he's become my friend, but more than that, he's become deeply connected to me, um, and, and I want you to take him back. And the thing that when I prayed... God, what is it that you want me to see? The second half of verse 9 really hit me hard. He said, it's none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So when I say that, it's none other than Paul, an old man, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, right away that word old man just jumped out at me like God was speaking to me in that moment. And it was, wow, Paul's had enough time on the planet enough revolutions around the sun, enough birthdays or candles on his birthday cake to realize something that the best way to go about this is to not demand my authority, but to speak to this other person, friend to friend, man to man, and ask him to do this deep thing. Now, the other thing that I thought was really interesting is he refers to him um, in the this interesting phraseology in verse 11. He says, in verse 11, formerly Onesimus was useless to you because he was a slave, right? And he stole from me and he ran away. But he's become but useful to both you and me. And that's cool. Uh, I, I underlined that. He was like, he was useless, now he's useful. And so as I underlined those, I wanted to go a little bit deeper. And so I was like, I wonder what people's name, what do these people's names mean? Sometimes it's good to just go crazy and Google things, right? Google's I know people are like, Google's not trustworthy. Most of Google's pretty trustworthy. Um, and so you Google Onesimus, and his name actually means useful and profitable. And so like his destiny or his identity was supposed to be useful and profitable, but he was useless formally, or in the ancient Greek, pote, but now, um, but now, denune, pote denune. You can't have the former without the latter. And so what he's saying is, is that he used to be but now, and so when I say you can't have the but now without the formally, formerly Onesimus was a slave and he was useless, but now he's useful. Your life formerly was painful, but now God wants it to be profitable. And this is the application um, that, that is so deep. This is the handlebar. This is the thing that you grab a hold of is that Paul saying this guy who was nothing is now something. Why? Well, because of God's providence. Instead of asking just why, though, ask what? What is God trying to show you in the moment? When you're reading the Bible, you think back and about how God uses you, how God has used you, how he's made you useful, how he's made you good. And so what does God want to show you? I, I can't have but now without the formally. So my history, my story is important. So what's God speaking to me? Formerly I was sick, but now I've been healed. Formerly I was addicted, but now I'm becoming clean and sober. Formerly I was depressed and anxious, but now I find peace in him. Formerly our marriages were hanging on a thread, but now I'm seeking God. Formerly I was lost, but now I'm found. Formerly Onesimus was nobody and he was worthless, but yet God fulfills his namesake and gives him a second chance 
chance at being purposeful and useful. God has the power to rewrite your story. So when we say the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood, the author of heaven and earth comes down to earth to help you write the next chapter of your story. And as you read God's word, it's alive and it's active and it's powerful. It'll speak to you. It'll shape you. It'll guide you. It'll empower you. It'll guard you from temptation. It'll renew your mind. It'll build your faith. It'll show you the heavenly riches of God. His word is true. It'll set you free. So why do I need to word, read the word of God? Why do I need to study God's word? Because I, I don't want you to lose out on God's plans and purposes for your life. I want you to go deeper and I want your life to be reclaimed. What was once useless can now be useful. What once was painful can now be set free. What was once nothing is now something in Jesus' name. Let me pray for us. Lord, as we wrap up our time together, we think of you with gratitude that you would take the time not only to give us your son Jesus as a, an example, but that you would write it all down and have these collections of stories and poems and laws and, and, and wisdom written down for us that we could apply these teachings and that we wouldn't just hear, but we would actually put into action and that we pursue a deeper understanding. May your presence guide our steps, leading us into the riches of your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.